Right, straight away, this is not a flashy presentation. That last one was superb um, in terms of amazing sort of stuff. Leicester is kind of right in the middle. And I started off with this slide just to put a little bit of context because we're now kind of on the map because we found a dead king in a car park. Um, that was in 2015. Um, the car park is now a scheduled, ancient, scheduled monument. So if you've been to Stonehenge and fancy going to another scheduled monument and you see there's one in Leicester, don't go, it's a car park. We're hoping to find his feet this time. Um, 2016, we won the premiership, da da da. Um, 2017, on a development site, uh, uncovered a um, really amazing Roman pavement which has been lifted and is going to be recited in our Jury Wall Museum when it reopens. And another surprising fact about Leicester is that it's one of the top five locations in the UK at risk of flooding, according to the Environment Agency's NAFRA data. 7,000 properties are at risk from river flooding and further properties are vulnerable to surface water flooding. So for us SUDS, is a key part of what we're going to do in order to lower those risks to people and properties in the city. So going back to where we are, the map on the left-hand side is the Trenton Humber Catchment Management Plan. And you'll notice that Leicester's right at the edge of the area. And this is the Trent-specific area. So there's not a lot that we can do by looking at our upstream areas because we're already there. You know, we, we can't control the water coming into us and do things at the top. So we have to do it within the city itself. The pattern of development in the city is that we've developed on the floodplain itself. We've got high land to the east and west, and there's major, well, there are water courses that bring water in very quickly into our river valley and cause the problems with the flooding. The key other issues that we're facing are urban, the pressure for development, but also things like um, it's an urban creep, you know, the fact that we're losing land all the time to extensions and driveways and sheds and you name it. So the amount of permeable land that we've got is decreasing all the time. And that's an issue about actually raising awareness of what that means. Um, this is on the left, that's the plan of the city. If you can pick it up, this line here are the boundaries of the city. The blue areas are critical drainage areas, and the red outlined areas are hotspots. So all the land in the blue areas can contribute to increasing flood risk at our hotspots. So actually, there's probably something like 70% of the city that are where um, it's in critical drainage areas. So places that you wouldn't expect to have um, controls and fears about their contribution to flooding, they're in there. So you know, people say, we don't get flooded. But because they're in that particular area, if you do development there, it contributes to increased flooding to vulnerable areas. And that's a difficult message to get across, the fact that your water potentially goes somewhere else. And that's one of the things that we have to work with. Um, there is a, a story we had of when I presented to local councillors. And I said, you know, water moves. And if we manage to shift it out of Leicester, it hits Loughborough. And one of the councillors said, so? You know, and these are the sort of challenges we've got. So what have we got in policies? Well, the first thing, um, Leicester prides itself on being Britain's first environment city in 1992. So we've always had quite good policies. And in our core strategy, core strategy policy two, we've got a policy about all development is to include studs. That's very kind of broad brush, but it is in there and it gives us power. Um, and then when we couple that, with the critical drainage area, we start to have teeth to force developers to do things. Added to that, we've got policies that also include surface water management in our climate change SPD, in our green space SPD, biodiversity, and hopefully we can work together to maximize the opportunities for SUDS. Um, we've got our flood policies, and also we've got the Sustainable Drainage Guide. The Sustainable Drainage Guide is a very, it's an introduction to SUDS, um, but at least we've got it there. It's on our website, we can point developers towards it. Um, 
I always show this. This is Hamilton. The advantage of having Hamilton is it's now about 18 years old. It's quite a long time for suds. Um, it's a very simple scheme. It relies on four swales taking the water down to a series of wetlands, which eventually then goes into something called the Melton Brook. Had these swales and wetlands not been there, then the Melton Brook could have flooded Belgrave, which is one of our most dense, densely populated housing areas. Um, but there's other advantages to the swales. Um, they produce, or they provide biodiversity, they provide interest, but they're also a good study. And we've done a kind of peer review and we've discovered things like the engineer who oversaw this never actually went to site. The project engineer never went to site. So we said, you know, this whole thing about maximum slope, one in three. Some of those slopes exceed that. And he said, really? And the, the engineering consultancy is in Leicester. So, you know, you kind of learn that you've got to get out there and get people concerned and get them to go and visit their own schemes. So this is a really good scheme for people to go and see and for us to take people to for us to learn and others to learn from. And talking of learning, um, I set up this county-wide SUDS group. And what we do is we go and see schemes. We do other things as well, but we go and see schemes. This is Melton Post-16 School. And the guy standing in the middle is somebody called Dave Singleton, who's a very keen... Um, landscape architect practice, who does lots of suds. Um, we've got in that picture, we've got planners, got flood risk engineers, we've got people working in the business, standing in a swale after a really heavy rain event. And what I wanted is to get people to understand that swales aren't like the Upton model. Swales can be that gentle. And if you go back in the summer, on a good day, that's a wildflower meadow. But you know, that's, that's getting across a message. I'm fed up of seeing developer strategies come in with pictures of Upton. I don't want to see Upton because you create these big barriers to freedom of movement. I want to see something like that that everybody can enjoy. But we've also we've been to see Bob Bray schemes. We've been to see the scheme at Blaby, the Grangewood Manor Taylor Wimpy scheme, where you could actually demonstrate a profit for the developer from having done suds. There's all sorts of caveats to that. But basically, because of the lack of underground engineering, the lack of constructed outfalls, etc., um, there was a net gain that £700 per house was saved. Now, there are things that community sums were waived and things like that, but it's still a learning thing to go and see. And then we did go and see Seven Trent at Coventry. We couldn't get the water company to come and talk to us. So we all went to the water company, and that's helped build some links, and we found that we can actually ring them up directly and talk to them, and that's helping us get better schemes. I'm really lucky in my job in that I get to do practical schemes, and this was the first, first flood-related one. And the top left picture shows a field, but you can see the National Space Centre there. And if you could but see it, there's a ditch running across there, taking flood water from the A6 into our river. The picture on the right shows the created wetland. It provides 1,000 cubic metres of storage. It was funded through a green infrastructure strategy and some Section 106. And there's a nice, nice story about the museum nearby, where the curator said, you're building a wetland thus you're putting us at risk. And it's like, no, we're not putting you at risk. We're building the wetland to take the water so you won't be at risk. She was deeply sceptical, but she let us put our displays up in the centre. And it was really interesting because people came into the centre and started talking about where they lived and the problems of flooding. And she became our best advocate. She really got it. And she was telling people that this works. And that's that's when you know you're kind of converting people. And last month, the mayor, we have a very strong city mayor. The city mayor and the deputy mayors all went on a walking tour of this area. And um, we got to the wetland, and I heard the mayor telling everybody about the scheme. 
And I wanted to rush in and go, that's my baby, that's my scheme. He was telling people. And that's really important because, you know, I asked Bronwyn about the political support. Especially in the city where it's very concentrated, you know, we know our patch. And all our councillors know about the risks of flooding. But if we can get the councillors to start advocating for suds, you know, that's, that's, well, that's the key aim. That'll make a real difference. Um, this is one of my favourite examples. This is a park in the city, and the picture on the left shows the flood relief channel. Working perfectly well, no criticism in terms of flood conveyance, doing absolutely nothing in terms of amenity, um, in terms of safety even. If this is a public park, nobody wants to go there. So a kid does run there, falls over, cracks their head, you've got a problem. This pond, the river, the river? The watercourse now, all the sides have been graded out. We've got um, viewing platforms, we've got rills, we've got riffles, we've got bird life, we've got interest. That's now the focus of the park. And you know, it's changed the whole nature. And sometimes I use this slide in a presentation about bad water, good water. And I really think the left is bad water, the right is good water. If people can understand why we're letting water be there, they'll come along with us, especially if it also happens to look nice. We've got our permeable paved examples. That's Tesco. And it's fair enough, it does a good job. But we do have... This is quite old now, but this is the ASDA example in the city. And this was as the national standards were coming in. And ASDA thought, we've got to do something. And they tried this out in Leicester. And what they've done here is they've taken all the roof water and they've taken it across to a massive 10 metre wide filter drain under the car park. And then the last third of the car park is picked up by a very narrow filter drain and then it all feeds through to a slightly wiggly swale, which I actually had to go on site with them to actually get them to do wiggles. But, and Astra pleased with that. You know, they, they've got a sense of humour, it looks good. So it's, it's a good model. <coughs> the reason why they didn't want to do permeable paving, by the way, is there were three reasons. One was that you've got lots of turning movements on a car park, and they weren't convinced that block paving worked terribly well. They do all their schemes by design and build, and they weren't sure they'd get the degree of supervision to make sure that they were built properly. And the third reason is that the majority of people going shopping do tend to be women, and women tend to wear heels, and when people make a claim against a supermarket, they tend to settle. So they were saying that even if they win the claim, or whatever, every single time a woman in heels um, damages her heels by the permeable paving <coughs> jointing material, it's going to cost them 7000 So, you know, that's a key driver to look at other ways of doing things. This is De Montfort University. It's right in the middle of the city. It's the classic old te technical, co co technical college um, that's grown, and a series of buildings have been taken over for the university. It had no heart or soul. Its key selling point was that it is in the centre of the city, so that students could live in the city and have that sort of life. There was a highway right through the middle of the university. Um, and what we did is the highway had been bollarded off. But effectively, everybody still walked on the pavements. Nobody walked down the middle of it. So we said, this mill lane, this has to be the focus for the university. And this has to be a selling point for the university. But also, it's in a critical drainage area. It's also in a, a risk from river flooding. So we've got to think about surface water management. And what we've actually got, see, can you see, is a series of interconnected rain gardens that look like this, going right through. And if you look at the top left, you can just about see the highway with its bollards. One of our planners said, this scheme looks like somebody's emptied a garden centre onto the university. I think they were trying to be critical. For me, that's the highest praise. The university used this now to sell itself. It has been so successful 
I should say, by the way, that the rain gardens hold the equivalent of two Olympic-sized swimming pools. I always forget to say that. It's been so, so successful and popular. Um, I'm not sure everybody understands that it's also South, but it's been so successful that, guess what? The University of Leicester, which has always kind of prided itself on being the university, the old one, hey-ho, they've come out with a scheme for a walkway with interconnected rain gardens. So I don't mind that they're copying. I do mind that I want them to get it right. But, you know, success breeds success, hopefully. I'm going to talk about another of the wetlands we've done. We've got a lot of money from the Environment Agency to manage the river flowing through the city. And this was a situation where a small, narrow piece of land, there actually, meant that floodwaters backed up. And around there, you've got Victorian terraced housing. No opportunities for suds, you know, even retrofitted. Um, so they were kind of sitting targets to receive all the floodwaters. So it called for radical approaches. The first approach was an engineered approach that was going to cost 30 million that would be um, traditional engineered defences. This was a totally different approach, which included looking at the way the water moved, allowing it to move through, but also retaining it on site. So I'll see if I've got the plan. So opening up to allow the floodwaters to move through, but as they move through, a series of deliberate lakes through here, massive attenuation area, but at the same time, new paths, new wildflower, just opening it up and creating a park. This cost seven million. Massive saving, maximum benefits. And um, you know, those kids now walk to school. They walk to school through this new park. So, you know, happy mayor, happy people, all the rest of it. Yeah. Yes, so successful that the then environment minister, <laughs> things changed quickly, came up to Leicester to launch the natural flood management program. And there you can see the different lakes. And they, the, there's high biodiversity value, they form fish refuges, you know, they're really popular. Right, I'll speed on. Um, just to say that the president of the RTPI visited, he was so interested he was on his phone. Never heard the end of the explanation. Uh, we're doing lots of retrofit schemes in the city centre. We use tree pits, we use, um, this is all permeable resin bound gravel. That was the first scheme we used um, gabions to space out the proprietary products that were very expensive. Now we're using them standardly and this whole area is permeable. The trees up there, the tree pits are part of the scheme. So we're doing lots of that. So I'm going to whiz on. Um, small scheme but really important. The highway drains at grade. That is the first example of us adopting that scheme. So small achievement, but to get to that was major, and that's our first adopted permeable paving. I'm going to go through these because I want to get to what we're working on at the moment, which is this. We recognise that developers don't want to spend lots of time and money going backwards and forwards with us saying this isn't right, or the commuter sum we're going to expect you to pay is huge. We know these are issues for developers. We want to help them as much as possible. So we're working on something called the Technical Adoptions Guide. What this hopes to do is give developers the confidence that if they do bespoke solutions and within some frameworks they have an understanding of what we'll, um, what we'll put commutable sums on, they're more likely to actually talk to us um, to actually look at studs as a real way forward. Um, we've got some very simple principles, and we, we want to provide some um, just ideas of approaches that might be acceptable. So this is one where it's a home zone, and we might accept a rill down the middle of the home zone, and then taking it through a raised platform to then go to the green area beyond. Commute is some negotiable. 
This is our approach to trees, where we're using boulevard approaches that will probably want those to be outside our adopted area and within management companies. And that's a whole other issue. But then if you get that sort of solution, you wouldn't get a commuted sun. We have battled with our highways adoption. We are gradually getting a few scenarios that they will look at and adopt, and that's what we want to really capitalise on. But it's been a struggle. So our successes are interdisciplinary working. We've got the Lead Local Flood Authority, Nature Conservation, even people like archaeologists. You know, we need to make sure they're all happy. Um, parks, because we want to use their open spaces to manage our water, so we've got to make sure that they're thinking along the same lines that we are. And I'll finish off with, finish on a high. Um, we did a scheme across schools in the city with the Environment Agency money, and this is children being involved in disconnecting down, down pipes, and you know, if you've got kids being excited about drainage, and why not? You know, that's got to be good news. Thank you to Chrissy. Um, once again, uh, we've got a couple of minutes for one or two questions of clarification. Uh, as before, if you can state your name and organisation once the microphone reaches you. So, anybody with any burning questions to raise at this point? So, there was uh, a couple of bits and pieces where you were talking about um, just trying to make success breed success. Um, so is that something that is, is an active promotion within the, within the city or is that something that has just kind of happened for, off the back of some of the schemes that you've been running? No, bizarrely, I did actually have some funding to promote SUDS when I first started. I started the council 10 years ago and um, there was a kind of recognition that surface water and SUDS were important but nobody was really taking hold of it. And then we got one of those weird funding streams and I was actually able to do some promotion and that funded taking people out to places and just gathering information, doing case studies, disseminating that information across the different bits of the council and really trying to take SUDS thinking forward. I mean, it was, it was quite a challenge and I still remember um, somebody who took me to task that I was going to have the whole city working wonderfully for year one, but by year 20, nothing would work and it would all be my fault. And it, it has taken a long time to work through what those issues were and how we move beyond them. Still, still going on some aspects of that, I've managed to persuade our highways adoption people to go down to Oxfordshire and to meet Gordon Hunt. And I, I'm going to do everything I can to keep telling people about good schemes. And I was saying earlier that at the moment, I'm showing people one of the Sustrain examples, the Alma Road in Enfield, because we've got a site where rain gardens along the road is being proposed by the developer, and it's a question of, of finding out what the issues are. And if you read that case study, it talks about the maintenance and the implications for maintenance, and it's an interesting study that, I say, when I start to put that forward to the engineers, their first response is, it looks pretty, and you have to get them to carry on reading carry on reading, see what it actually says, ring up the people if you need to. There are good schemes happening and it's my job to kind of tell people about them and we can do it too.